Today we're going to be looking at Jesus the Savior. So there isn't any certain passage I want us to turn to yet, but I do want to start off with the need for us to realize that we all need a Savior. There is something that we all really have in common, and that's that we all came from the same two people, and that's Adam and Eve. Even though everybody looks different, everybody came from the same two people. So we're all related to the first couple. There's really only one race of people, and that's the human race, but there is something that's very wrong with this race of people. Adam and Eve were created in sinless perfection in the garden, and when God created them, God said himself in the word that it was very good, but they chose to disobey God, and because of their disobedience, they ruined the peaceful relationship that they had with, with God. Spiritually, they died, and physically, they would die too. Their sin resulted in the fall, and as a result, all of Adam's descendants are born fallen, having a, a sinful nature. Psalm 51 verse 5 says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. And this is a condition for every, every human being. We're all born in sin. We're all born as sinners and live as sinners. Everyone is by nature a slave of sin and bound in their sin and cannot be freed from it no matter what they try to do. And it's all the result of Adam's fall. And this can be, de can be described in just four words. Brother Stewart mentioned it this morning. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 22. And those four words are, In Adam all die. In Adam all die. Not some die, not most die, not the worst ones die, but in Adam all die. Because of Adam and Eve's sin, everyone is affected by it. And we all die because of that. And it's not just a physical death. It's a death resulting in all people being punished with everlasting destruction before the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. And that's hell. That's the lake of fire. And that's what the result is for everybody. An honest person once said that if God hadn't created a hell, then he would need to create one just for him because he would ruin heaven if he went there. Ephesians 2 says about us that we are all sons of disobedience, children of wrath, so what hope does fallen mankind have? What hope do we have? We can find the answer to that in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12. Anybody want to look at that? What hope we have is found in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12. Anybody know that passage offhand? What hope does fallen mankind have in Ephesians 2, 12? No hope. We have no hope. Man has no hope. Someone can say, well, don't we have hope in, in Jesus Christ? Well, I'm talking about fallen mankind who doesn't have Jesus Christ. He has no hope. There is no hope for the person who rejects the only offer of salvation that God offers him. Man's state is, is, a, is a condition where he's born in sin. He's born spiritually dead. He's born bound in sin, fallen separated from God, and the, the result is going to be eternal punishment, and along with that, he has no hope. And if man was innocent in the matter, we could see that God in sending his son, Jesus Christ, for sinners would be justice. It would be God rescuing poor, fallen sinners from their state. But salvation is not justice, because man is not innocent. Salvation is not justice. Salvation is mercy. We are not innocent. If you'd like, you can turn to Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13, a very familiar passage. In Jeremiah 2, 13, we see there that we are not innocent. Man is guilty. The prophet Jeremiah said there in Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewn themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Of course, this is referring to when God was speaking to the Israelites, but this really has to do with all people. All people have committed two evils. What are these two evils that man is guilty of? The first one is man is guilty of forsaking God. Through the prophet Jeremiah, God said that man has forsaken him. Can you imagine that? That is God's accusation of man. For my people have committed two evils, they have forsaken me. God is saying that, saying this about his own people. They have forsaken him, to abandon him, to 
This is to, to leave him, to, ab to abandon him, to renounce God as their God. They have forsaken him. The prophet Isaiah said, I have, or God said through the prophet Isaiah, I have stretched out my hands all day long to a rebellious people who walk in a way that is not good, according to their own thoughts, a people who provoke me to anger continually to my face. So here we have what God is saying. He's holding out his hand all day long. That's all the time. This is God constantly extending mercy to, to his people. And they're constantly rejecting God's mercy. He is actively extending mercy. He's actively trying to reach out to them, and they're actively rejecting him. These, this rebellious people, this is, this is sinners. This is us, sinful people who don't have God's grace. And if we're saved today, this was you before salvation. And this is you in spite of salvation because you'll always be who you were when God saved you. And any act of grace that God has done in your life is merely a work of God in your life. And so all because of the Lord. Salvation is of the Lord. So we have God actively extending his hand all day long to a rebellious people. To reject God means that we had him or we could have had him, but instead we chose to reject him. And that's really a shocking thing to realize. God has extended to us mercy. We've chosen to reject that. In Jeremiah 2.13, what does God call himself? He says there, they have forsaken me, the, the what? The fountain of living waters. The second evil we have here is that they have hewn themselves cisterns. Cisterns were underground storage tanks usually dug out of rock for storing water. God had already called himself the fountain of living waters, who they rejected, and now they're digging their own cisterns. So rejecting God wasn't enough for them. They're actively trying to, to create for themselves their, their own idols, their own false gods. You don't need the fountain of living waters if you have your own fountain. That's what they thought. They rejected God, and, and they sought to replace what God could offer them with their own fountains. By the way, God is replaceable. God says that. God says that. God said broken cisterns that can hold no water. Of course, the, these Israelites knew how to make cisterns. God wasn't talking about actual underground cisterns here. He was saying that they were rejecting the fountain of living water and seeking to gain themselves their own fountains through idols, through false gods, and they have rejected the one true God. And I've met people like this, uh, people who, who say that they believe in God, but they're not sure that th if they're born again, they, they haven't really made a profession of following after God. They haven't come to, come to the place where they say, I want to join the church, or I want to be baptized, or I believe I'm a Christian, I want to be held accountable as a believer. Uh, but these people also haven't gone to the world. They rejected the temptations to go after the world. So they're stuck in between Christianity and the world. But it's not until these people go back to the world and leave the church and leave the people of God to where they've committed this second great evil. But in reality, all of us co have committed the, these two evils. All of us are guilty of rejecting God and of, of, of hewing our own cisterns, you could say, and forsaking God and, and creating our own gods. We're all guilty. None of us are innocent. Paris Reedhead was a missionary to Africa, and he talked about a time when, when he went to Africa initially, and he went there because he thought that the... He looked at the condition of the Africans and he thought, well, they were, uh, they were in a situation where they were in poverty and there was a lot of sickness and they were struggling. And he thought that these poor Africans needed a, an option to believe in God. They couldn't live in this, in this sad state and at the end of their life end up going to hell. So he thought that he needed to go to Africa to give them an option to believe in God. And when he got there, he was surprised because he realized that, that they knew God. They knew God because of, of creation and, and because of their own conscience, but they rejected God. And this is a state with everybody. Everybody knows that God is there. Everybody has a conscience. Everybody knows that, that God is who he says he is, but they've chosen to reject him. So man is not innocent. Man is guilty. And if God were to give us justice, then we'd all be condemned. But our creator is a merciful God who is full of pity. Psalm 86 verse 5 says, for you, Lord, are good and ready to forgive and abundant in mercy to all those who call upon you. 
Psalm 145 verse 8 says, The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and great in mercy. We're all familiar with what God did. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Jesus came to redeem us, to rescue us, to save us. So God can forgive us of our sin because we have a, because we have a Savior. Now, I did stress that man is, is hopeless. He's hopelessly lost. So someone can wonder, well, how can man go from being in a, in a condition of being born in sin, being fallen, bound in his sin, and going to be judged and, and end up in hell, to where I can say, well, now we have a Savior in Christ. H how do we go from being lost to being saved? Uh, we, can see it, we can see it enough in the life of Zacchaeus. We don't have a whole lot of detail with his life, but we do have enough so we can know how someone goes from being lost to being saved. Zacchaeus, he knew that there was something special about Jesus Christ. So we see in the scriptures that he climbs up into a tree to see above the crowd. And when Jesus sees him, Jesus says, Zacchaeus, you know, come down from there. I must stay at your house today. And Zacchaeus makes haste to come down. And at Zacchaeus' house, we see that he's repentant. He's telling Jesus, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I've wronged anybody, I'll restore it. So we see repentance there. Jesus told Zacchaeus in Luke chapter 19, verses 9 and 10, Today salvation has come to this house, because he is also a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. So Zacchaeus wasn't saved by good works, but we do get to see Zacchaeus before he is saved and after he is saved. We do get to see Zacchaeus's, his response to the grace of God being shown in his life where now he's repented and now he's willing to give away everything to follow after Christ. But what do we see there in Zacchaeus' life that shows us he went from being someone who didn't know God to someone who's, who's born again? Well, Jesus said, today salvation has come to this house. But Zacchaeus was following Christ. Zacchaeus was, was looking for Christ. He was going to Christ. He wanted to be with Jesus Christ. And, and that's what salvation comes to. Also, if you want to think about it also we can think well Jesus told him come down from there I need to stay at your house and Zacchaeus didn't question Jesus Zacchaeus didn't say no you know if, if Zacchaeus could have rejected Jesus's command there or Jesus's words there but Zacchaeus did exactly what Jesus told him to do and that's what it is to become a Christian it's to desire Jesus Christ and when you open up the scriptures the first thing that you read there you just obey it because you want to follow Christ. God's people are followers of Christ, or disciples of Jesus Christ. The purpose for which Jesus came was to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus came in the flesh, not sinful flesh, but, but true human flesh, born of a virgin. He experienced persecutions and, and trials. He was, he was a man, he was the son of God, and he gave himself to, be, to die on the cross. He rose from the dead on the third day, and he ascended back to his Father in glory. And in doing that, he secured salvation for all of his people. The name Jesus means Savior. Matthew one twenty one says about him, You shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. We know that Jesus came to save because that's the meaning of his name. Peter said this when he preached, Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. There is salvation in the name of Jesus Christ, but there is no salvation in anyone else other than Jesus Christ. And there are so many religions in the world, but they are all man's attempts to be, to be right with God according to their own works. And God says that that is filthy rags, that is unacceptable to God, because we're, we're fallen, as we've already looked at. God has given us only one Savior. And Jesus isn't only the Savior for Christians. He's not just the Savior for those who believe the Bible. Jesus is a savior for all people. He's a savior for the Catholic, for the, for the Jew, the Buddhist, the Muslim. He's a savior for the Hindu, for the atheist. It doesn't matter what religion someone is born into. They must come to God through the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus is, is a savior for the American, the African, the German, the Asian. Jesus is not a tribal deity. He's a savior of the world. He's the only savior that God has offered. 
to sinners in order for them to be saved. We read in Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 and 10, After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could number of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues. That's everybody. doesn't matter what ethnicity we're born into. It doesn't matter the color of our skin, the language that we speak. Jesus is the only Savior. It says there that we were... It says there that they were standing before the throne of God and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. John the Baptist said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the what? The sin of the world. Jesus is the Savior of the world. He's the world's Savior. And he's the only option that we have. He's the only option that we've ha we have. We've already established that sinners are not good. There's nothing good in us. There's no hope for us outside of Jesus Christ. But be careful because you can be following a Jesus Christ, but be following the wrong Jesus. You can believe in a Jesus, but not believe in the Jesus of the Bible. We have that in the scriptures. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 4, it talks about another Jesus who the apostles did not preach. I once believed in another Jesus, another Jesus who was okay with me when I had all my rosaries on one side of my room, and I wasn't a devout Catholic. I didn't pray the rosary. The rosary is full of idolatrous prayers to Mary. I didn't know any better. I just was, I guess you could say, lazy in my religion. But I liked the different colors, and I liked how the rosaries were all uniformly hanging on one side of my wall. But my Catholic Jesus was okay with what I had, was okay with my religion. But the Jesus of the Bible forbids us to pray to anyone other than God. The Jesus of the Bible forbids us from praying to anyone like Mary, even though she is a Christian in heaven. It doesn't matter. We do not pray to people. And the way we can guard ourselves from believing in the wrong Jesus is by reading the scriptures, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, reading the gospels, reading what the apostles preached and confirming that what they preached about Jesus Christ, that it's the same Jesus that we believe in. The Jesus that's spoken about in the New Testament and the Jesus who is spoken about in the Old Testament. Jesus said specifically about the Old Testament scriptures. These are they which testify of me. From Genesis all the way to Revelation, the scriptures testify about Jesus Christ. That's how we know that we're worshiping the right Jesus. Because he's the one who is spoken about in the Bible. And Jesus is a complete savior. The sinner doesn't take part in this great work of salvation. And this great work Jesus Christ did it all. Jesus doesn't help those who help themselves. The sinner doesn't kickstart his salvation, and Jesus does the rest. Jesus does it all. The sinner doesn't do the first step, and then Jesus comes in and, and helps him. We can see this in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, that salvation is fully the work of, of God. It says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. The author of our faith means that he began it. He's the originator of our faith. He began our faith. And then it says, Jesus is also the finisher of our faith. This means that he didn't just begin our faith and, and then now it's up to us to maintain our salvation. It's up to us to keep ourselves saved or, or to keep ourselves walking the narrow path. No, if Jesus began our salvation, if he's the author of our salvation, he's also going to finish our salvation. He's also going to keep ourselves, keep us saved. Some people think, well, salvation is just keeping the Ten Commandments or, or trying to, to obey God and being sure that we repent whenever we feel that we sin too much. But salvation is much more than just keeping the Ten Commandments. If that's all it was, we couldn't even do it anyways. But it's much more than that. Colossians 1.13 describes it as being transformed from or transferred from darkness to light or being taken from the devil's kingdom and placed into the kingdom of Jesus Christ. That's something that we cannot do. John 3, 7 describes salvation as being born again. Again, something that is impossible for us to participate in. We cannot contribute to our salvation. Uh, I believe most of us contributed to, to uh, baby Abigail and, and, and the needs of the family. But when it comes to our salvation, there's no contribution that we can make. There's no part that we can, we can play when it comes to our salvation. It's all a work of God. Just like it was with our father in the faith, Abraham. When God made his covenant with Abraham, what did God do to Abraham? Anybody remember? He put him to sleep. Yeah, he put him in a deep sleep. 
And that's the same covenant that we're a part of. Usually when people make a covenant, they both come together and they both give their vows. You can think about the marriage covenant. The man gives his vows, the woman gives her vows, and, and there's a covenant there, and they both need to keep their part of the, of the bargain, of the covenant, the agreement. But when it comes to Abraham, our father in the faith, God put him to sleep. There was nothing that Abraham could do to, to contribute to this covenant that God was making with him. God did it all, and that's salvation. God did it all. There's no contribution that we make. There's no contribution that we can, that we can make. Again, Jesus is the author and the, and the finisher of our faith. Do you believe that? Do you believe in a Savior who has done everything for you? Who began your salvation? Who will finish your salvation? A Savior that you can contribute nothing to your salvation? Do you believe that? And if you believe that, don't think that that's your contribution to it. Well, you think, well, I believe it. Well, then there, that must be some kind of work there. Well, no, your belief in God is only the right response of a true regenerated heart. Salvation is completely a work of God. We read in the scriptures that belief in him, faith in him, even re our repentance, it's all gifts from God to the new believer. Faith and repentance. If you see faith and you see repentance in your life, that's, encouraged, that's a way you can be encouraged that God is truly working in you. And those fruits continue on. You continue in faith. You continue in repentance as you continue to walk with God through the power of the Holy Spirit. But salvation is all work of God. It's, it's all what God has done for you. And it's not God doing most of it and you doing part of it. God must do the complete work. And Jesus was the suffering Savior. We see this in Isaiah 52. You can turn there if you'd like. Isaiah 52, we'll be, look, we'll be looking at a few verses in chapters 52 and 53. Jesus was the suffering Savior. Isaiah 52, verse 13 says, Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. Jesus has been exalted, but before he was exalted, he had to suffer. Verse 14 says, Just as many were astonished at you, so his visage or his appearance was marred or ruined more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. His appearance was ruined so much to where he was unrecognizable with all the whipping and the crown of thorns being placed upon his forehead and all the beatings that he endured. You know, we can see pictures of a crown of thorns upon a picture of what people say is Jesus and there's a couple of trickles of blood coming down but that's not the way it was. A couple of my, my boys got um, cuts in their head and when they're horse playing, but it was on two separate occasions, like probably over a year apart, so don't think that we're bad parents. But, um, but they got cuts on their forehead and, and there was a lot of blood. And as that, because that happened, I looked into it and found out that our, our heads have a lot of blood vessels there I guess, because our, they're, they're feeding the brain. So there's a lot of blood vessels on the head. So any head injury, even if it's a, a regular one, will have a lot of blood. So you can imagine this crown of thorns being pressed upon Jesus' head. There was blood coming down all of his face and all of his head. <clears throat> and this is what Jesus endured. Look at uh, chapter 53 of Isaiah there, verse 3. It says, He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Grief there, if you look up the word grief, it's, it's a deep sorrow that someone experiences when a loved one dies. This is a, a deep sorrow. This is not just some kind of sadness that someone forgets about in a few days. And Jesus was acquainted with grief. He was very familiar with it. He knew exactly what it felt like. We do have the time in the scriptures when Jesus wept, but Jesus was always dealing with the scoffers who would argue with him. He saw the people who he loved afflicted with disease and, and with death and in bondage to sin. Of course, we know about the agony he experienced on the cross and even the garden before that when he was praying to his father. Jesus had to deal with the, the physical weakness that he had to endure and just being a man. And being a man who, who exhausted himself every day from morning to night doing God's work with the needs, the great needs of the people. He had the devil constantly trying to tempt him. 
we're aware of the time when the Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. But what does Luke chapter 4, verse 13 say about the temptation of Jesus by the devil? Does it say that the temptation was a one-time thing there in Luke 4.13? Someone want to look at that? In Luke 4.13, does, does that lead us to believe that this temptation that we have here in Luke 4, I think it's also recorded in, in Matthew 4, was it a one-time thing that Jesus endured? Maybe that specific event was a one-time thing, but was the devil's temptation his attacks on Jesus, his affliction against Jesus, was it a one-time thing that Jesus had to endure? No? Who said no? Said for a season. Yeah, for a season. Now, when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time, or until, well, how does it read? Until, another, until a, a season? For a season. Yeah, yeah, he returned. So most people will not know what it's like for a demon to constantly afflict afflict the person. Most people will not know what it's like for a demon, a specific demon to afflict him. We, we have what enemies we have against us, the flesh, the world, and the devil. Our flesh can give us a, enough difficulty throughout our walk with God. The world can give us enough difficulty throughout our walk with God. But also there's the devil. And there's also the demons. And most people won't know what it's like to deal with a demon seeking to afflict them. But Jesus had the devil himself all the time following Jesus around, seeing how he could afflict him, seeing how he could tempt him. We know that one of Jesus' own disciples belonged to Satan. We know that the, the leader of Jesus' disciples was used by Satan at one occasion when Jesus had to rebuke him sharply. Peter also forsook Jesus. And denied ever knowing him. All the disciples forsook Jesus. Jesus was a man of sorrows. Man of sorrows, what a name for the Son of God who came. Ruined sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah. What a Savior. And that Savior had to suffer. Verse 4 of Isaiah 53 says, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement or the punishment of, for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. That's when he was whipped. That's the flogging he endured. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter. And there in verse 10, in verse 10 it says, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. In order for us to be forgiven, God didn't just say, Well, you know what? Forget about your sin. I'm going to ignore your sin. God, if, being a just God, had to deal with our sin. And if God dealt with our sin upon us, we would have all been condemned. So God removed our sin from us. There's a verse that says it's removed as far as the east is from the west. But it didn't just go away. God didn't sweep it under a rug, as it were. God placed our sin and the sorrow that goes with it upon his son, Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus had to suffer. In order to be a savior, he had to suffer because he took the sin of all of his people upon him himself, along with its guilt, along with the condemnation upon himself. Jesus is a great Savior. In Ephesians 1, it says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound towards us. The ESV says there, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us. So we have forgiveness of sins abounding towards us, forgiveness of sins lavished upon us. And I, I can ask you, Christian, are you discouraged because of your walk with God? Are you discouraged because you look at your sanctification, you look at your service to your God, and, and you think, oh, you're not doing enough, you're failing, you're not measuring up? Are you discouraged because you're not serving the church the way you, you feel that you should? I, I think we all should, should kind of uh, keep a, an idea of where we're at with the Lord and where we're at in our service. And, but sometimes we can, we can realize, you know what, I just keep failing. 
I just keep messing up. And that can just bring us to discouragement. Are you discouraged because of your walk with God? Well, be sure that that doesn't take you from looking to Jesus Christ and how great a salvation you have. Forgiveness of sins, complete forgiveness of sins. Here's another one in Hebrews 7.25 that shows us this great salvation that we have from our great Savior. Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him. Save to the uttermost. There is no lacking in his salvation. You are completely forgiven of your sins. You can end there. You can stop there. I'm forgiven of my sins. And you can just revel in that truth. What else do we need when we have Christ? What else do we need? Is there something that the world has that, that you're lacking? Is there one more thing that you want that you don't have? You have it all. And you know what? You've had it all. Since the moment you were born again, you've had it all because you had Christ. You have forgiveness. You have Jesus. You have his, his delight in you. You have the, robes of, the robe of righteousness upon you. There's nothing, nothing you need to add to your, to your salvation. And we, can, we know that, right? I, I hope we can separate in our heads our salvation and our sanctification. I hope we can separate those two. But sometimes we can just get overwhelmed with our sanctification to where we can't take a moment to enjoy the fact that we have such a, a great Savior. In spite of all of our inadequacies, well, that's why we have a Savior, because of all of our inadequacies and all of our sin and all of our failure and all of our pride. We need this Savior. We didn't just need him the moment we were saved. We need him today, and we will need him tomorrow. We need him until we're in glory. And then we can just rejoice in him without sin, without the flesh, without the world. So we should look to our great Savior because he is enough and rejoice in his forgiveness. Jesus is the Savior for all people, for the whole world, right? But he is a Savior for sinners, but he is only the Savior for sinners who are needy sinners. Only needy sinners can find salvation in Jesus Christ. Jesus only saves those sinners who recognize their need of salvation. The one who doesn't recognize his need of salvation, he will never be saved. He may be interested in Jesus. He may even be religious, but he will never be saved. The people wondered why Jesus ate and drank with tax collectors and sinners. Jesus spent most of his time with the worst people. Rather than those who look good outwardly, those who look like they had it all together, Jesus spent most of his time with the tax collectors, the sinners, the prostitutes, the demon-possessed. He went and, and, and sought after the demon-possessed, those who needed him, those who were sick, those who were dying, those who recognized their need, recognized their need of salvation. In Mark chapter 2, verse 17, Jesus responded to those who accused him of always spending time, of always eating and drinking with tax collectors and sinners. In Mark 2, 17, Jesus said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Jesus said, I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Of course, no one is righteous. Jesus is only talking about those who think they're righteous, who think that they're okay without having Jesus as their savior. And Jesus is saying he did not come to call them. He only came to call those who are sick, those who recognize their need of him. Now, this happened when Jesus was invited to the Pharisee's house, Simon. Simon invited Jesus to, to his house, and while he was there, a woman, I think it says a woman of the city, she was a sinner, one of the worst sinners. But the thing about her was she recognized her need of the Savior. She came to him weeping, washing his feet with her tears, putting ointment on his feet, and that's where Jesus mentioned to Simon, he said, the one who loves much or who has been forgiven much loves much and the one who has for been forgiven little loves little. And that woman was saved there because she recognized her need of the Savior. She was saved. Possibly Simon was also saved because he could have been the one that loved little because he was forgiven little. So possibly Simon was saved too. But what about the other Pharisees who were there? The other Pharisees who were there and, and looking at this woman so close to Jesus and thinking if Jesus were a prophet, he would know that she should not be touching him. 
Why were they there? Well, they were there spending time with the other Pharisees, but they were very interested in Jesus. Jesus was a very interesting person. He healed the sick. He raised the dead. No one could debate him. He was a wise man, claimed to be the son of God. He was very interesting. But they were there, and they left there, and they weren't saved. But the woman was saved. Jesus didn't come to save those who are interested in him. He didn't come to save those who, who, who are just interested in him, and they don't go any further than that. He has only come to save those who recognize their need of a savior, those who see themselves as sinners. It must have been very embarrassing for that woman to have been there, and, and all her tears and her hair hanging all down, her hair was her, her beauty. It, it, she, she looked like a mess. And she, she probably didn't like that. Everybody was just judging her, looking at her, and, and they didn't like her, and she didn't like them. But she knew that she needed a Savior, and she knew that the Savior was there, so she went to Jesus Christ. So J Jesus saved her, and he will save all those who come to him. Can we remember that? no matter how long ago it was for us, if it was recently or a long time ago. Do you remember coming to Jesus as your Savior and being so needy? Maybe, maybe crying a lot of tears, maybe seeing the, the magnitude of, of our sin and our need of Christ. And, and time can just cause us to forget that. But he's the same Savior that we needed back then. He's a Savior that we need today. Even though you may have cleaned up a whole lot, all glory goes to God. Even though you, you probably don't struggle with the same sins you struggled with back then. But he's the same Savior today. And, and he's our Savior. And it's a great salvation that we have through him. Let's pray.